All right, we'll get started here. Uh, people can continue to file into the back or sit up front if, if you would like. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. I'm moderating today. My name is Chase Paulson. I'm one of the new second year residents. Uh, this stand is actually way shorter than I thought it was. Um, <laughs> But we have a couple all-star speakers today. Starting up is Mubarak Muhammad, one of our wonderful chiefs. Uh, he will be presenting on surgical approaches and the repair of open globe injuries. But uh, importantly to state, he is a massive, massive Cleveland Browns fan. Fortunately, they're not doing so so hot this season. But uh, I assign each of each of these gents um, a most likely. And I think for Mubarak's uh, in the future, he is most likely to marry into royalty. So we're excited to see how that goes. We'll let Mubarak take it away. Thanks. Um, let's see if we can get this going. Yeah, no financial disclosures. Um, so I was just going to just touch base on like the surgical approaches in um, open globe uh, injuries. And this is more so to like also benefit me as I was like a chief resident in a lot of these open globe um, cases. Um, and hopefully it's helpful for uh, junior residents as well and other people might benefit. Um, so in terms of just like classification, I know like the, the terms kind of get like muddied up in terms of like globe rupture, rupture globe laceration um, and penetrating, perforating. Um, so there is like a classification like um, system in regards to uh, how you classify ocular trauma. Uh, so ocular trauma can be closed or open globe. Um, so we know like closed uh, globe injuries uh, as far as like uh, vitreous hemorrhage, uh, coronal rupture, um, hyphema, um, and then on the other end are these open globe injuries, which are full thickness defects uh, of the eye wall. Um, ocular um, trauma itself, uh, in terms of uh, both closed and open globe, obviously has a high um, morbidity in terms of um, kind of visual outcomes. So something need, that needs to be addressed. And then as far as kind of the specific classification for open globe uh, injuries, uh, they're primarily classified using standardized terminology describing uh, blunt or sharp uh, mechanisms of injury. Uh, so globe rupture, um, which refers to blunt trauma, where um, transient elevations in IOP uh, lead to uh, kind of this like compressive force that leads to a rupture uh, away uh, from the initial site. Uh, kind of at a weak point. So we know kind of weak points uh, include uh, brightness months and insertions um, at the limbus um, and prior surgical sites as well. Uh, globe lacerations, on the other hand, are uh, caused by sharp trauma, um, where uh, you know you have kind of a, a uh, thickness defect uh, from the initial site of injury. Uh, they can be classified as penetrating or perforating. So penetrating, you have the initial uh, insults uh, kind of at that site, but it does not go through an exit wound, uh, and then a uh, perforating injury as both a, um, a penetrating or a, a, a initial wound and then an exit wound as well. Uh, as far as the zones of injuries uh, for uh, open globes, uh, you can have um, kind of distinctions in three zones. Uh, zone one, which is the corneal through limbus. Uh, zone two, which is from the limbus to five millimeters posterior to the limbus uh, near the uh, spiral pillow. Uh, and then zone three, five millimeters and beyond. Uh, and importantly, both penetrating and perforating injuries can have uh, the presence of an intraocular foreign body as well. Uh, quick epidemiology demographics associated with uh, open globes are uh, varied by mechanism. Uh, it's not surprising overall, most open globes are by men, uh, mostly with uh, work related injuries. Uh, and then globe ruptures are a little bit more common in women, uh, usually from falls, as well as elderly folks. Uh, following ocular trauma, open globes must be uh, quickly ruled out, as we know. Um, the goals of evaluation are identify the mechanism of injury, uh, characterize the extent of the injury, and then gather uh, relevant history. Um, and it's paramount that you have a detailed and consistent examination. Um, injuries can range from an obvious open globe, uh, like in figure A, where you have you know an obvious fish hook uh, kind of emanating from the anterior sclera. Um, but they can be a little bit more subtle as well. So in figure B, you can see a pupil there, no evidence. Uh, uh, scleral laceration, but uh, that peaking of the pupil kind of points to where uh, that um, likely uh, open uh, uh, wound is. Uh, suggested findings include uh, shallow AC depth, uh, irregular scleral, scleral contour, a uh, peak pupil like we see in the figure B. Uh, you can have displaced or missing structures, so as far as the iris or you know, the lens, 
and then uh, dense 360 degree uh, hemorrhagic uh, hemorrhagic hemosis in the context of ocular trauma is also highly suspicious for uh, an open globe injury. As far as imaging, uh, the preferred modality is non-contrast orbital maxillofacial uh, CT here, which we're able to get in a uh, level one trauma center. But there are some folks that can't get this, so CT head is also uh, okay in this uh, scenario. Uh, it has high specificity, uh, specificity and moderate sensitivity. Uh, most specific CT findings for open globes are changes in globe contour as well as vitreous hemorrhage. Here we see kind of four uh, pictures here, panel A. Um, panel A, you have a deformed globe, which is obvious on the right side. Uh, panel B, you have an open globe with presence of vitreous hemorrhage, uh, which appears as areas of increased intenuation that can be layered. Uh, panel C on the left, you can see the presence of a metallic intraocular form body as well. Uh, and then panel D, a little bit more subtle, we have um, kind of a difference in the AC depth that was noted by the radiologist. On the left side, you can see that lens uh, corneal space is a little bit smaller, and they actually measured it there as well. And then notably, uh, MRI is usually contraindicated in the context of uh, oral trauma and concern for drug deformed body, given the uh, catastrophic results that can happen uh, with the metal in a MRI scan. As far as the perioperative management, uh, ideally a primary repair within 24 hours, uh, at least improves visual outcomes as well as low rates of enophthalmitis. In addition to uh, cortical hemorrhage, uh, immediately if you see an open globe, you want to leave any visible foreign body alone. An eye shield should be uh, placed immediately over the affected eye. You want to verify the tetanus uh, status uh, and medics to reduce the risk of Valsalva, uh, which can lead to kind of expulsion of intraocular content if it's not controlled. In addition to pain, and you want to give the patient's antibiotic prophylaxis. As far as anesthesia, uh, general anesthesia is recommended. Um, and I think here uh, that's going to be our preferred pattern uh, as far as practice. And it's recommended to avoid uh, depolarizing agents uh, such as succinylcholine, which can lead to co-contraction of extraocular muscles, uh, which again uh, on the table can lead to expulsion of intraocular hemorrhages as well. As far as the surgical exploration, um, usually begins with gentle irrigation of VSS. Uh, you can consider cultures of the wound and any prolapsed tissue, um, given the kind of the context that's been open for a while. Uh, it is uh, suggested. You're going to do a 360 per enemy to expose um, and inspect all four quadrants of the sclera. And this is to rule out uh, posterior open wound injury. Uh, and then, as far as injuries underneath the rectus insertions, they require removal of the muscle uh, tendon at the uh, site. And obviously, you want to reinsert after an inspection um, and square with the pair. Uh, general surgical approaches um, the primary goal is to secure a watertight uh, closure and restore uh, normal anatomical uh, ocular relationships. Um, as far as suggested suture sizing, um, generally people um, do non-absorbable sutures, um, and you can kind of vary between uh, the different corneal or uh, ocular tissues. So a little bit less uh, diameter uh, suturing for the cornea, teno, uh, and then sclera either seven or eight o. You can use absorbable micro uh, sutures in the closure of the conjunctiva. And as far as the suggested suture type, um, we use spatulated uh, microsurgical needles. Uh, for corneal and scleral uh, repairs. And then as far as for perimeter repair, you can do a uh, tapered uh, needle. Uh, important considerations for wound closure. And, you know, certainly, you know, these are things I'm still kind of, you know, um, learning myself about in terms of it's kind of how to place these sutures kind of exactly where, and it's a lot more complex than, you know, I initially thought. Uh, but you want to think about the length of the bite, a uh, short or a long suture bite, uh, the depth of the suture, Orientation is it uh, oriented uh, radially versus uh, more oblique? Uh, spacing of the suture bites uh, closely spaced or further apart, and then the order of the closure. Um, where should you close first, and kind of which sequence should you do so as well? And then all these things actually do play a part in um, adequate closure. Um, these approaches and techniques may vary in regard to the extent and location of the open globe injury. Um, obviously, a corneal laceration is going to be a little bit different than a posterior scleral laceration, which can visualize kind of the posterior edge. Um, but there are a few common principles in the surgical repair, um, and I just listed five here that I just wanted to review, uh, just kind of based on the literature I read. But you want to avoid a necessary excision of uh, extruded ocular, intra intraocular tissue, which is obvious. Um, try to save as much viable tissue as you can. Um, you want to reapproximate the limbus again, kind of restore, restore the normal um, anatomical landmarks first. Um, and then you want to place uh, sequential bisecting sutures. And we'll talk about those here in a second as far as kind of how to best approximate those linear wounds. 
Um, and number four, uh, minimizing suture placement in the central visual axis. As we know, the cornea is kind of an optical system, and uh, the less you can uh, place at the central visual axis, the better the visual outcome will be in terms of both uh, refractive and then uh, optical clarity as well. Uh, and then um, just the general principle in terms of surgery, longer suture length uh, leads to stronger uh, wound closure. So we'll use kind of these five principles just to kind of talk about different suture closures or uh, wound closures in regards to open globes here. Uh, and these are just kind of the main ones we kind of talk about here. Uh, as far as uh, corneal laceration repair, um, I just highlighted kind of three types of uh, corneal wounds here. You have a corneal scleral and uh, panel A, corneal limbal wound and panel B, and limbus to limbus uh, corneal laceration uh, and panel C. So I'm um, just kind of focusing on panel A first. Um, and we want to employ those general principles. Uh, you want to approximate the limbus first. So as you can see, uh, the wound itself is uh, that red dotted line, and then the sutures themselves are kind of those black. Uh, vertically oriented uh, lines there as well. Um, so after approximating the limbus, uh, you want to treat the corneal and scleral lacerations as separate wounds. Uh, and then what you do next are these uh, sequential uh, bisecting sutures where you essentially uh, kind of divide the wound into two wounds here. After you place the limbus, it increases the uh, corneal wound, you place the bisecting suture here, and then for the scleral lacerations, and then uh, over here, and then place the wound here. And then uh, adjacent as well, just to kind of put it uh, in context as far as the order. Um, in terms of the corneal limbal wound, which is panel B, uh, similar principle here, um, where uh, you want to close the limbus um, first. A little different in this type of wound, where uh, you see that uh, it is uh, affecting the central visual axis. So to minimize the sutures, um, and you know, obviously give this patient a little, a little bit of a better chance at you know, better visual. Uh, activity after the suture, you want to have those sutures be um, a little bit more closely spaced at the central visual axis and shorter. Um, and the reason why they're uh, more uh, closely spaced is to give it a little bit more tension. I um, mean, obviously, making them uh, shorter will uh, kind of decrease uh, the effects that it has on the central visual axis. Uh, and then lastly, you have a limbus to limbus uh, corneal laceration there. Um, and so you close the limbus first, and then essentially you do two half closures and similar principles as well as far as uh, these bisecting bites. And then as you kind of go to the central visual axis, you want to have shorter, smaller bites uh, to kind of decrease um, uh, kind of the risk of both scarring and then things like uh, stigmatization. And then occasionally you run into these complex angulated uh, corneal lacerations. Um, general principle is to first place the suture, uh, the penultimate, and the first one at the location of the angulation. So here you can see, um, you know, this kind of SC. Uh, laceration, and so you place suture number one and two at the angulation. Essentially, you have uh, three, three separate wounds. Um, you close the peripheral wounds first, and again, that sequential bisecting manner, uh, and then uh, the central wound thereafter. As far as scleral lacer laceration repairs, they're a little bit more simple. You don't have to worry about the optical properties of the sclera, um, but again, uh, you do employ some of the similar techniques in terms of the different types of uh, laceration repairs. So, panel B, you see an anterior scleral laceration. Uh, pretty simple in terms of the repair. So you do uh, that initial suture kind of right in the middle of that uh, repair, and then you just kind of sequentially kind of go out uh, and fill in as you go. Uh, in terms of complex stellate lacerations, um, there is a suggestion to close the linear segment of the complex wound first, and then you can close the intersection with a mattress or a purse string uh, suture. Some people do advocate if it's hard to approximate both on the sclera or the cornea. Uh, to do an initial mattress or purse string suture first, and then to be able to close the linear lacerations um, afterward as well. And then in terms of posterior scleral lacerations that extend beyond the equator of the globe, um, essentially you're just placing the sutures in an anterior to posterior order until uh, surgical exposure is inadequate. And the uh, main theme there is you don't want to uh, try to get better exposure at the risk of uh, expulsing more on toilet contents. Uh, and then as far as suture technique, um, again, something else I'm also kind of, you know, learning about um, some important principles, uh, you want to place sutures perpendicular to the wound, which is a general principle. Uh, you want to be able to provide enough tension for the closure. So in panel B, you can see uh, kind of in the top, uh, you see good apposition and uh, not enough tension in the uh, lower picture there as well. 
Um, and then you want to have bites be equidistant uh, to the wounds for the most, um, for the, in most cases. Um, so panel C, you can see, uh, the, you know, the bites are um, pretty similarly spaced between uh, uh, to the left and to the right of the wound. And then below, you can see an inadequate uh, closure there as well. Um, the exception to this rule in terms of equidistant bites um, are these shelved or oblique lacerations. Um, so you generally want to place longer sutures favoring the overriding uh, portion of the, uh, the wound. So uh, you can see that in panel D where uh, the left, uh, that uh, bite is a little bit uh, longer than the initial. And then generally you want to bury knives away from uh, the visual axis again for optical clarity. Additional special considerations in corneal repair. Um, we talked about that the cornea is an optical surface that requires special treatments um, to preserve visual acuity, both from scarring and then refractive error. Um, there is some thought, you know, there, I've kind of read that some people opt for like full thickness corneal sutures. Um, there's a theoretical risk of infection, but uh, there's a less distortion in edema. So there's some um, folks that um, kind of do full length uh, uh, sutures, at least in corneal repair. Um, I know the that we do here, we you know usually do seventy to eight uh, percent thickness as far as uh, our repairs uh, both for uh, PKs as well as uh, these uh, complex uh, corneal laceration repairs for open globes. Um, importantly, near the limbus, uh, suture should not be full thickness. Um, there's a risk of epithelial uh, downgrowth from the limbal stem cells uh, in that area, so those should definitely be partial thickness. Um, and then uh, surgical principal sutures that create tension that flattens the corneal surface. So um, as we can imagine, you know, closing peripherally with longer shallower bites and uh, shorter, deeper passes in the mid-peripheral uh, or the mid-apical cornea leads to kind of uh, preservation of the corneal um, shape. Uh, and then here are just a few uh, representative images of just uh, some laceration repairs, some good, some bad. Um, so figure A, you see, uh, uh, closure of this kind of limbus to limbus um, uh, long carnial wound with a uh, properly closed wound. Uh, so you can see the sutures are longer in the periphery. Uh, it might be a little bit harder to tell on the screen. Um, and then kind of gets smaller as you uh, get to the visual axis. Uh, the spacing is adequate. Uh, the wound itself is not gaping and there's no punching of the wound either, uh, indicating that tension uh, is uh, good in this case as well. And then you can see um, it is post repair, so uh, scar formation is, is pretty minimal. Uh, figure B, you have a similarly long wound, uh, limbus to limbus. However, the suture bites are uh, pretty arbitrary, and you can see kind of the placement of it. Uh, they're not all uh, kind of perpendicular to the wound. Uh, there are some wounds that are a little bit more um, taut, other ones that are a little bit more loose, and you can see that the sutures are um, a little bit haphazard in terms of kind of the length as well um, to the sutures. And so all this kind of led to a distortion of the corner wound. You can see that it's uneven uh, with bulging um, the wound edges. Uh, and then lastly, panel C, just on the bottom, the simple anterior scleral laceration repair. Um, you just got to see several interrupted sutures uh, that are likely repaired in a bisecting uh, sequential mm -hmm. manner. Uh, and you have uh, to worry less about just kind of the uh, length and kind of the spacing of the sutures. But again, you want to do a good closure with a uh, watertight seal. Some special scenarios, obviously these could also be um, ran around socks of themselves, but just kind of to highlight um, maybe things that we can run into uh, as for carrying these open globes. So a violated lens capsule, um, cataract extraction should be performed at the open, uh, at the time of the open globe repair, if possible, um, or secondary repair uh, within a few days to a week. Uh, the goal is to reduce the risk of lens induced to uveitis and postoperative glaucoma. Um, and certainly prolapse vitreous, we know requires anterior vitrectomy with a vitrectomy probe as opposed to uh, simple aspiration. And then in terms of intraocular form body, again, a very big uh, topic here. Um, there's, you know, relatively low um, number of uh, cases that do require this like one stage repair with vitrectomy. Um, it's primarily for like concurrent uh, uh, intraocular form bodies and then concerned for endophthalmitis. Uh, there are a few foreign materials that pose a significant risk uh, in terms of ocular toxicity, which includes iron and copper, as well as organic foreign material. Um, but uh, inert materials such as like plastic, zinc, aluminum, or glass uh, can be tolerated until secondary repair um, and or allowed to be uh, in place as well. In terms of uh, the goal um, of the surgery itself, you know, obviously you, you want to 
have the interactive forward button removed um, as safely as possible. So, uh, you know, there are some thoughts as far as primary versus delayed removal. Um, certainly, it's not evident that cases of endophthalmitis mm -hmm. need to warrant immediate removal given the risk of infection to, to the eye. Uh, if the patient is unstable for extended surgery or if there's a vitreo retinal surgeon that's unavailable and there's no signs of endophthalmitis, you may decide for uh, to do a removal. Um, and then uh, primary or immediate removal is associated with a decreased risk of endophthalmitis. We mentioned decreased risk of uh, proliferative uh, vitreo retinal uh, a PVR, and then a decreased risk of anesthesia. Uh, given that the patient is going under general anesthesia, you know, just once and having all that in. The lastly, in terms of uh, prognosis, um, you know, we do have to, you know, certainly counsel these patients. And a uh, common question that we get asked is, you know, what's my visual outcome potential? Uh, will I ever see again? Um, and so it certainly can be very hard uh, the discussions, you know, from the moment. Um, there's this ocular trauma score that has been validated. And I think the initial was published, I think, in the mid 90s. And so it kind of gives uh, initial raw score uh, based on the extent of the injury. So people start off with 100, and then you uh, kind of progressively have uh, a, a number subtracted from your score based on uh, these uh, various uh, visual factors, which include like rupture and ophthalmitis, uh, perforating injury, random detachments, uh, presence of an APD. Uh, and then they used a uh, probability kind of um, raw score table. Uh, just to kind of show um, kind of the outcomes uh, based on this open group. So you can see a raw score of anywhere from like 92 to 100. Pretty good um, chance of you know, having a good vision over like 95% to be 2200 better. And then if you're anywhere between 0 and 44, you know, there's a 70% chance that you're no light perception. Um, so that's pretty much all I had. Again, kind of a quick overview, um, more so just kind of for my benefit, just to be able to read up on these things as we're dealing with these open groups that are cheap here, but so people have found benefit too as well. Be yeah, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dr. Muhammad. Next up, uh, we have our very own uh, Dr. Dessa Tells. He Jordan and I actually played in sports against each other as kids. Jordan will not admit to beating me, but uh, he definitely embarrassed me in many events. But uh, no, <laughs> uh, Jordan, a fun fact about Jordan is he's actually been struck by lightning. Um, so maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about that in a minute. And I voted Jordan most likely to be on a new reality TV show, pleasantly lost in Alaska. <laughs> Oh, sorry, here I go. Just get this pulled up. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about traumatic open globe injuries at the Marana Eye Center um, and reviewing some of our experience that we've had as surgeons operating on these cases over the last year. So in terms of objectives, I really want to kind of review the demographics and characteristics of open globe injuries at the Moran Eye Center over the last year. And I also want to spend some time describing the literature that we use to base our timing repair guidelines. Um, and at the end, review some lessons and uh, possible points of improvement or, or thoughts for the future going forward. So for the methodology, you can actually, there's this really cool tool in Epic. You can actually build case reports in Epic. Um, so I actually built uh, my own search tool. This was kind of my first experience with this. Um, and in terms of defining the parameters, I only use cases performed within the last year. Um, that's from October 1st, 2023 to October 8th, 2024, when I ran the analysis. And that's partially because it's just a lot of information to go through, but I also kind of wanted to reflect that period over which we have been using um, our new OR case add-on time protocols, um, where we want to get patients in the OR by 5 p.m. to hopefully respect our call team and get them out by 7 p.m. Um, we used locations only being the Moran and the main OR. We did not look into pediatric open globe cases just because uh, that's a whole separate issue dealing with Icentra. Um, 
And the service was set to ophthalmology because um, it's weird. There are some extraneous like dermatology cases and stuff that may get in there. Um, and then the relevant procedural CPT code codes um, included 65275 for repair of corneal lacerations and uh, 65280 to capture um, both corneal and scleral lacerations, and then uh, 65286 to capture just full thickness islands in general. Um, those were fairly broad and intentionally sensitive. Um, so a fair number of results actually had to be manually discarded. And then I also had to contain in the procedure description contains open glow. Just uh, again, there was just a lot of extraneous cases and that helped uh, get that number down without having to get rid of any relevant cases. So essentially all the charts corresponding to the generated MRNs were manually reviewed. And the data was structured into an Excel format. I know you can't see this. I just want you to see that I made an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> um, and um, we only included traumatic open globes. You know, some of the cases that we have are um, infectious perforations or immunologic corneal perforations, things like that. Those are not as amenable to um, timing analyses. Um, and so those those were left out of the analysis. Um, and ultimately, I collected data data on age, gender, self-reported race, home zip code, try to get a sense of when the patients were arriving, when they were going to the OR, when the injuries occurred, um, and then also descriptions of the injuries and some of their follow-up uh, data, including their visual outcomes um, and um, kind of where they stand now with any secondary surgeries. So all this is really to describe, you know, who are our open globe patients and where are they coming from? So within the search period from October 1st to October 8th, over the course of one year, we had 35 traumatic open globe injuries that were operated on here by Moran Eisner surgeon or at the main university OR. 6% of them were female, 29 were male, Going well for the guys. The average age of our patients is 51 years old. 65% of them are white. And then I also wanted to look at, you know, where are these patients coming from? So 64% of our patients come from within the state of Utah. And I actually went through all their charts and got their zip codes, which can be a little bit tricky because some of these people are traveling from, say, California and then get in a car accident in Idaho. So there were limited cases where you have to use the outside hospital to which they first presented as a proxy zip code. And then all of those zip codes were essentially plugged into Google Maps and routed to the Moran Eye Center. And that was done under uh, no traffic, no inclement weather conditions. And what we see with that analysis, the average drag time for our open globe injuries is two hours and 20 minutes. Now there's a huge variation in this, and some of them are coming you know, from way northern Montana, so that right shifts the data a little bit. So when you look at the median time, it's only about an hour, um, which I thought was actually really interesting because I think we get this sense on call that people are coming from so, so far away, but most of them really are within an hour of our institution. Operations by day of the week is actually fairly concordant with what we would expect. There's more operations performed on Sunday. This reflect, reflects the general rowdiness of Saturdays and Saturday nights, uh, but we do have consistent volume throughout the week as well. If we look at the proportion of cases performed on site, a little over half of the cases we perform here at the Moran OR and just less than half go to the main university OR. <laughs> The visual acuity here is also somewhat what you would expect. Um, if you look at the difference between the presenting visual acuity seen in blue and the final visual acuity seen in red, um, we do see that the proportion of patients with very poor vision, say 2,800 or worse, increases after repair, um, and the patients with what we call in the open globe world good vision or 2,200 or better does increase. And then you can see that unfortunately, some of these patients are lost to follow up. When we think about the injury types that we see here in Utah, we definitely have less violent trauma, less firearm-related trauma than maybe some other urban centers do. 
Um, but our injury types are actually fairly concordant with what is published in the literature. About 60% of our injuries are blunt trauma with globe rupture. And then 40% are laceration injuries, either perforating or penetrating. And 10 cases, so about 30%, are involving retained intraocular foreign bodies, eight of them metal, one wood, and one glass. The time to operating room analyses are inherently challenging because you're relying on only the data that's that's in the chart, and sometimes that can be sparse. But I essentially wanted to break this into two components, and and one of those components is time from the injury to the time they go to the operating room, um, and that's a little bit more difficult to estimate. Most of the records I reviewed actually in the HPI by the resident, they do say what time the injury occurred and what date. But some of them just say generally like in the morning on a certain date or in the afternoon. So some sort of property times did have to be used for that analysis. But in terms of the time from arrival to operating room, which is what I think we care about more, um, we essentially just use either the first, the time of the first ER triage note, or if they somehow came directly to us, like through our triage center, um, then we just use the time of the initial ophthalmology note. And what we see perform that analysis is we actually do a really good job getting these patients to the OR. So the median time from getting to our facility to going to the OR is 11 hours. You know, and that's much less than our standardly cited 24 hour range. Um, and we only had one instance where the patient went out to 24 hours after they arrived here. If you look at time from injury to the operating room, a lot of those factors are really outside of our control, um, but that median is much higher, um, 22 and a half hours, although there are some way outliers that kind of pull some of that data to the right as well. So I wanted to do a little bit of a subgroup analysis and look at our uh, prolonged injury to repair time cases and just see if there's any data we could ascertain that was you know, really driving this. We don't have enough cases to be statistically powered, but there are some general trends that, that can be um, included. And there's 15 total cases of injury delay. About a third of those cases have some legal implication. So either there was an assault um, or there was a self-inflicted gunshot wound, and you wonder to what extent that may drive delays in care. Um, a third are work-related. You know, again, this is fairly speculative, but you start to think about things like, you know, employer status, um, worry about repercussions with employment, worrying about immigration status, do those things come into play? The biggest factor that, you know, seems to be identified here is presenting to an outside hospital before getting to us notably decreases care. They spend hours and hours and hours at these outside ERs, and then the transfer process is inherently long. So in conclusion from our analysis, essentially our average open globe patient is a 51 year old white guy from Utah. Um, and our injury pattern and visual outcomes actually track really well with nationally published averages. And we do a really good job with antibiotic prophylaxis with our intravenous and sometimes intravitreal protocols. Um, essentially none of our patients develop endophthalmitis. That's that third point's impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. It, and, and so no one, some people came to us with endophthalmitis, like we had a wood foreign body from Montana who had been in the backcountry already for 24 hours and came in with endophthalmitis, but no one secondarily developed endophthalmitis after the time of repair, which, which is very impressive. And I'll talk about some of the national average for that in a moment. Um, and then, as I said, our patients are a little more local than it feels like. And we do a really good job actually of getting people to the OR promptly. So I have to be honest, I, I think when I was looking at the timing outcomes, um, they didn't. I was a little surprised because they didn't necessarily match how I felt on call. I felt like there were certain instances when I was on call and I was thinking to myself, geez, you know, would this patient have been better served by getting to the operating room more expediently? These are the cases where, you know, it's 3 p.m. and you're still working on the intake and trying to get scans and there's no way you're going to get that patient to the OR by 5 p.m. This is talking about the Moran specifically on a weekday to get that goal repaired same day. Um, and 
I'm gonna so I kind of wanted to explore the literature a little bit about you know where these 24 hour guidelines come from exactly. Um, and I kind of want to give a case that kind of demonstrates some of the challenges with defining why we get patients to the OR quickly. Um, and so this is a 77 year old male from Idaho who presented with a uh, right corneal graft did this after a blood trauma injury to the eye fell onto his dresser when he's getting up in the morning. Um, he had a previous uh, open globe injury in that eye. It was complicated by a retinal detachment. He had a scleral buckle and ACILL in place, and he had a prior corneal scar that necessitated subsequent uh, PK. And his baseline vision was actually pretty good, all things considered. It was 2060 prior to this injury. When I saw him, he had hand motion vision. He had 180 degree graft dehiscence. His ACIOL was visible within a flat AC, and the, the posterior view was, was very warped and distorted because the cornea was so distorted. It was essentially inverted from the hypotony, um, but you could tell that the, the media was actually very clear. that There wasn't any heme or anything like that, um, and the red reflex was actually decent. Um, Essentially, what ended up happening with this case is that he was found to have a minor aortic root dilation. It was only like 0.4 centimeters above the threshold, but that was two years ago. Anesthesia didn't feel comfortable with the case. Ultimately, the case got delayed, was not able to go at the, um, you know, by that 5 p.m. start time threshold. And so he ended up going the following day, right at about that 24 hour mark. And at that time, once I saw him in the OR with uh, Dr. Gill, essentially had dense anterior chamber uh, heme. There's no identifiable retrocorneal structures. Um, he's had been in significant pain, um, and he was actually like fairly distressed by all of this. Um, and his course went on to, you know, he's just had these kind of chronic choroidal hemorrhages. The heme has been difficult to clear. He's kind of ultimately gone for a secondary vitrectomy. Um, and I essentially have no way of saying, you know, would this guy have done better if we got him to the OR immediately? And maybe he wouldn't have, and maybe really likely he wouldn't have. But it kind of got me thinking, you know, are there are there other outcomes other than just like endophthalmitis and visual acuity that constitute morbidity and constitute a reason to go earlier? And two, you know, with these injuries where you have a clear media and you have some visual potential, what do we do? Do we have any guidelines to go off of in terms of that 24 hour rule? We always just cite 24 hours. So I really want to know where 24 hours came from. Um, and the 24 hour rule, it really comes from two major things. It comes from endophthalmitis rates and it comes from visual acuity data. And the best uh, study we essentially have on this is um, the meta-analysis was actually done this year in August of 2024, and they clearly show that endophthalmitis rates are lower if you repair the globe within 24 hours. Again, that is kind of limited because time is not treated as a continuous variable. It's just an arbitrary cutoff that people have sort of used in the literature for a long time, so then all the subsequent studies get based on that 24-hour time point. Um, and then if you look at visual acuity data, you don't see any difference in visual outcomes if you do the repair early versus late. That's in the aggregate sense, that's a population level. Uh, but again, I, I think some of that is driven by the fact that so many people's vision is just so devastatingly poor at presentation with no real chance for improvement. So how do you get a statistical effect from that? It's, it's hard to say. This is the same data just reiterated in a, in a forest plot and clearly see that endophthalmitis rates are lower, whereas the visual acuity data on the bottom is a little bit more equivocal. Um, and of note, a lot of the studies we have to drive all this stuff, they're mostly from outside of the United States. This is kind of the best survey we have, and only one study is from the United States. Most of the studies are from China, the UK, and elsewhere. Maybe the ocular surface bacterial profile is totally different. Maybe there are differences in protocol of repair. It's, it's kind of hard to know. Um, the other kind of limitation of this study is that almost all of the open globe injury data we have, or at least in the meta-analytical sense, it comes from uh, cases with intraocular foreign bodies. 
So like something like 8,000 of the 11,000 eyes reviews in this case, in this meta-analysis had an intraocular foreign body, which is sort of a different beast. Um, and so I wanted to review endophthalmitis a little bit and try to gain a little bit more nuanced understanding that may drive changes to our practice patterns. So if you look at the overall rate of all comers developing endophthalmitis after an open globe injury, it's about 7%. That's from our uh, essentially national eye trauma registry data. That data has essentially dried up because we don't have funding for it anymore. And so that stopped in 2013. Antibiotic protocols, surgical protocols have improved. So looking at more uh, recent data from US centers, this is Harvard's data from their ocular trauma survey. They get a rate that's closer to about 0.9% for endophthalmitis. Um, and that can be geographic as well. Places that have a higher incidence of foreign bodies, trauma, probably have higher rates of endophthalmitis. And essentially what they found was that it really was their intraocular foreign bodies that seemed to be driving most of their very rare cases of endophthalmitis. So it kind of becomes this question of like, what do you do with the intraocular foreign body? Because when we're thinking about, do we need to go sooner? Do we need to go later? That would be one of the main drivers to say, oh, I think we need to go sooner, at least in our minds. So I wanted to review the literature on the intraocular foreign bodies a little bit, specifically retained intraocular foreign bodies. 18 to 40 percent of open globe injuries have retained intraocular foreign bodies. Our data is consistent. We're at about 30 percent. Most of them end up in the posterior segment. A minority end up elsewhere. Again, mostly young guys. Um, and to my knowledge, there's no recent studies that show much of a benefit of early intraocular foreign body removal. There are older studies that were really done in the 90s that say the rates of endophthalmitis and the rates of PVR, proliferative vitreo retinopathy, go down if these repairs are performed within the first 24 hours. We have a lot of really interesting data out of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Huge series, 890 patients, 118 eyes that had IOFB removal. And because of the limitations of being in a combat zone, the mean delay is 31 days to get these intraocular foreign bodies removed. And patients actually do really well. There's not really any apparent effect on time to removal on the final visual acuity and alphamitis development or PVR development, assuming that the proper intravenous antibiotics or intravitreal antibiotics were delivered to the patients in a timely fashion. I think we have to take the Iraq and Afghanistan data with a little bit of salt. These are combat injuries. These are really, really hot foreign bodies. They're tending to come from, you know, projectile trauma. Yeah. But just, just I'm aware of some work in which they've taken those right out. I mean, they are hot. They're very, very hot. And, and, uh, and tried to sterile, you know, and to culture them. And, and so this is different. These things are sterile. Yeah, I, I think so. They're, I think these are predominantly sterile. Um, and, and also, they're, they're probably skewed towards being steel and lead just based on, um, like, the profile of the combatants that we were dealing with there. Um, whereas, like, we're probably dealing with more, like, low velocity, dirty, or possibly more organic material here. So. Again, it's hard to say for sure. And, and, you know, we also may deal with more things like copper and iron from more work-related injuries where you have a chalcosis risk or a siderosis risk where you'd want to go sooner. All this is to say is that we don't really, again, have great guidance on what to do. But this is the case um, that came in when I was working with Dr. Moshefar, um, actually as an undergrad. And due to the preponderance of metallic foreign bodies in the literature, you know, it drives all the literature, but I think we all in our guts see something like this. We have organic material in the eye, and you're saying this needs to come out probably like right now. And we don't, I don't think we're going to get a good data driven answer to when we do this. But I think intuitively, from a human perspective, I think we all feel that if this was us or a loved one, we'd want to get this out right away. And so you can't randomize this. They were going to do it now or wait. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, um, you know, we also don't have great data for how we manage other nuanced cases. Like, 
What if you have a patient with a fairly high ocular trauma score? So that's a good ocular trauma score with a you know, potentially good outcome and a somewhat unstable wound. Do you still take them at 24 hours? I think, I think mostly we would all feel that we'd want to take them as soon as, as possible. I think what's encouraging from at least our year of data is that we know that these cases where it's going to be a nuance like this are going to be very rare almost never happen. And so we want to really be respectful of our OR team and their time. And I think when we're trying to design a policy, something like potentially extending till 11 p.m. to do these globes on weekdays, you know, we can be assured that this is going to happen very, very infrequently. And we need to be aware that, you know, that is not a case where we want to utilize those services to repair an open globe that say has retina on the cheek or something like that, where it's very poor outcomes. Because in that case, we know that the endophthalmitis data is favorable. We know the visual acuity data is, favor is equivocal, at least after 24 hours. Um, so for future directions, I think it'd be nice to pull all the data in Epic if there's any uh, really motivated medical students that want to help me, that'd be great because it's really time consuming. Um, and then maybe kind of create some more institutional guidelines for specific parameters of like what are cases that would actually warrant triggering an on call team to come in, you know, on a weeknight till say 11 p.m. And that's essentially all I have. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Desitels. I'll be brief. Uh, Michael interestingly is a diver and recently found these collects some shark teeth and found some from a Michael Don. Um, I think if he grew his hair out to be like a 90s or 2000 shag, he could definitely be maybe the next Steever when it works on the backs of the <laughs> Yeah, interesting fact about shark sharks is that they have been on this earth longer than trees, uh, which I find pretty incredible. Um, but uh, speaking of things that are old, we're going to talk about visual impairment in an aging population today. <laughs> um, so we'll go over some recent demographic trends looking at population and prevalence of visual impairment. We'll touch on multimorbidity, and I want to introduce and illustrate the 4M framework of geriatric care, um, and then we'll go over a little bit of some current research that's going on. Picture here is myself and my paternal grandparents, both of whom have passed, but um, if nothing else, I hope we think about the older adults in our lives or in our clinic that could benefit from improved visual impairment or improved visual uh, function. So we'll start off with the case. This is a case of a patient that I saw while I was on my geriatric medicine rotation as a medical student in a pretty classic presentation that you, they get there. So JJ is an 87-year-old female, history of falls, hip fracture, hypotension, overactive bladder on oxybutynin. She is pseudophagic in both eyes. She has dry eyes, takes tears. She has mild POAG and bromonidine that she gets from uh, an optometrist uh, in the community. She has really AMD. Her BCBA is 2050, and, but she feels like her vision is absolutely terrible. She can't do anything. She has a hard time describing exactly what the problem is, but, and it's really frustrating to her. Um, she endorses some depression and feels isolated and can't enjoy her hobbies. So pretty classic case. Um, we'll touch on some of the literature and then we'll revisit her case. So global prevalence of visual acuity, um, the disease burden, burden is shifting thanks to improved uh, socioeconomic conditions and improved access to healthcare um, around the globe, shifting the disease burden from communicable diseases to non-communicable and age-related conditions, including visual impairment. This graph is from the Global Burden of Disease Study published in 2021, and you can see that they have severity of uh, visual impairment broken down. And so in the A is mild visual impairment. That all is projected to increase to 360 million people with mild visual impairment. Moderate, severe, and B will increase to 474 million. There'll be 61 million blind people by 2050 and an estimated 866 million people with uncorrected presbyopia. Uh, to put these numbers in perspective, that's a, almost 2 billion people with um, some kind of visual impairment the total population of China right now is 1.4 billion. Um, if you break it down by age, you know, aging and an enlarging population is the primary driver of these increasing of the increasing prevalence of visual impairment globally. And you can see on the right that the main burden of visual impairment is especially predominant in the seventh, eighth, and ninth decades of life, especially moderate severe uh, impairment, which is shown in the green there. 
um, and second only to uncorrected presbyopia. And a lot of this is because global life expectancy is going to increase to about 78.3 years um, by 2050. So there'll be a higher percentage of adults in that seventh, eighth, and ninth decade, which is when vision impairment is more disabling and tends to be uh, more severe. So in the US, see a similar trend. So right currently there are about 60 million adults over age 65 by 2050, there'll be 82 million uh, approximately. A recent study from 2023 using um, the nationally represented database found that 27.8 adults over 71 years uh, have some kind of visual impairment. 10% had distance visual impairment, 22% with near vision problems and 10% with contrast sensitivity impairment. Um, this increase from 60 to 82 million people represents um, an increase in the total share of population of old adults from 17% to about 22%. So multimorbidity is a huge problem in geriatrics, um, as we all know, um, and visual impairment is a risk factor for other chronic diseases such as depression and dementia uh, and falls. This study was published earlier this year and found that contrast sensitivity impairment was significantly associated with a higher prevalence of falls and a fear of falling, which is not necessarily new, but they also found that distance and near visual acuity was not significantly associated with falls. Um, and currently, contrast sensitivity is not recommended by the CDC or it is not a recommended tool in the NIH toolbox uh, for geriatrics and working up a patient um, with a recent history of fall or someone who is at fall risk. However, visual acuity is a recommended screening test. So the geriatric care model, um, you know, with this expanding older population, geriatric medicine is a growing and much needed branch of medicine. And with the goal, with the burden of ocular disease predominantly in older adults, there's a strong intersection between two fields. So very briefly, the 4M framework is like the fundamental paradigm of geriatric medicine. It focuses on four things that have been shown to objectively and subjectively improve health um, and quality of life in older adults. So what matters most, this focuses on what is most important to the patient. For some people, this will involve end-of-life care, but not necessarily. It can mean, you know, what hobbies they want to continue, are they working still, where do they want to live, et cetera. And medication mobility orientations to all support those, uh, those goals. So age-friendly medications, limiting unnecessary meds, staying mobile, and preventing, diagnosing, and treating cognitive disorders and depression. So let's apply the 4M model to our patient. Uh, just a reminder for kind of brief patient summary there. And of course, if we saw her in our clinic, we would want to do a full workup and run a bunch of tests and really decide, you know, the cause of her decreased visual acuity. But from a geriatric, geriatric perspective, these are some things that they would want to know um, and that can help us um, guide her treatment. So what matters most to her? She wants to live safely at home, not at a care facility. She wants to spend time with family and to read. These are the most important things to her. Medications. So she's on bromonidine, but she has a history of hypertension and falls. Is that the best medication? As we're working on for glaucoma, maybe we might make, make a change there. And we might recommend that oxybutynin is not the best uh, drug for her um, for her overactive bladder, given its known uh, side effect of affecting vision. Um, for mobility and maintain, we want to, of course, maximize her vision, correct any refractive errors, um, counsel about home lighting, and then possibly consider a, a, a referral to low vision. So what's being done now, there are a few things that we're working on to kind of help meet this need. Uh, picture you can see on the top is the eye care home too, and the bottom is the radius uh, virtual reality headset that we're doing the several studies on here at the Moran, including two usability studies to see uh, how older adults fare using these, and the results are looking pretty promising, uh, have the potential to be used at home and help limit travel, which can be a big burden for older adults, uh, among other things. And then the National Health and Aging Trends Study this is a longitudinal national representatives uh, database of Medicare enrollees, and since 2021 has been collecting objective visual data, visual acuity, and contrast sensitivity. And so it has huge potential to answer a lot of questions. And so Dr. Stag and I, one of the things we're interested in, as I mentioned, the CDC doesn't recommend contrast sensitivity um, as part of their workup for fall risk, citing a lack of evidence for or against. And so we want to ask the question, you know, should contrast sensitivity be a recommended screening? Would it help prevent falls? And so we're going to use this database to help answer that question. And then we're also uh, timing how long it would take to administer a contrast sensitivity test like the Pelly-Robson test in a busy geriatric clinic. 
Um, there are tons of low vision technologies. We have a great low vision clinic here. Um, technologies range from simple magnifying glass to you know high tech retinal projection uh, devices. And I actually met that gentleman in the top left corner. He's, he's wearing what's called an eSight. He was at AAO over the weekend, and uh, he just had nothing but great things to say about it. And really improved his quality of life. Um, there are also validated functional questionnaires shown in the right bottom right corner. Um, for our patient, JJ, she had a really hard time describing her visual impairment and where it was affecting her. And, you know, sometimes we'll ask, like, what is it affecting? What's the problem? And it's too ambiguous of a question sometimes, especially for these older adults who have a hard time communicating. So the questionnaire provides really specific questions to help identify areas where occupational therapy or low vision could really help target and work with skills or work, pick a specific device to help them, you know, maintain hobbies or you know walk upstairs or downstairs or other more specific things around the house or in their life. And then small incision cataract surgery pictured in the bottom left, um, a really cost-effective, efficient surgery to help meet the growing uh, demand of cataract surgery that's causing visual impairment. And it's taught by faculty here at the Marine and, and elsewhere. So summary, an aging and enlarging population will increase the burden of visual impairment in older adults and on society. Visual impairment is associated with worse overall health outcomes and is a risk factor for falls and other chronic disease. The 4M model of care can be used to help guide management and help us meet patients' most important goals and improve their quality of life. And it's important to incorporate new technologies and um, answer research questions that can help benefit our patients. These are my references, and that is a picture of our shark suit. Remember that one. Um, so if there are any questions, have the answer.